I'd love it if you go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we're doing our third and final part of this series, Battle Ready. The reality is on this subject, we could talk for weeks and we'll probably revisit it uh, at, at some point here. Uh, but we're doing a three-part series right now, Battle Ready, verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having and your, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word today and we invite You, Holy Spirit, to come in a fresh new way. God, we wanna experience You. I pray for those that are here today, maybe new to church, never been in church, checking everything out, new to Christianity, don't understand it all. But God, I pray that You make Yourself real to them. I, pray that they would feel your tangible presence. I pray that you would show up, Lord God, here and on us, Lord God, your, your children that love you. We've been serving you. We need a fresh encounter with you. And so Holy Spirit, our, our hearts are wide open. We, we need you to give us revelation in your Word. I, I, I pray that we'd come alive in faith, maybe to things that we've never seen before. Maybe we see them for the very first time today. But I pray, God, that we would go out better than when we came in, stronger than when we came in, more filled with faith than when we came in, full of courage, better than when we came in, more unified and together than when we came in. And so Holy Spirit, work with me and work with us today. That's our prayer in Jesus' Name. And everyone said, Amen. so Paul uses this word, finally, finally. And he is about to sum up the six chapters of Ephesians pretty much in three words. Everything God has planned, everything God has purposed, everything that God has predestined, everything that God has promised is gonna come to you, but it coming to you is summed up in these three words. Finally, uh, he's gonna do an overview of the book of Ephesians. Finally, chapter uh, two tells us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and made us alive together with Christ, by grace we've been saved, raised up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so the first word is the word sit. This is incredibly important for us to understand because our salvation, our Christianity, our authority, everything that we have comes to us through a position of rest. You don't have to earn God's love, God loves you. You don't have to earn God's grace, God's grace comes towards you. In fact, you can't earn God's grace. It is unmerited favour, undeserved favour, unearned favour. So you can't, you can't pay for it, you can't pray for it, God gives it to you. Everything we have begins seated in heavenly places, with all authority, at the right hand of the throne of God. Everything we have begins in a position of rest. Sit is the first word. The second word is the word walk. Walk. The object of the kingdom of God is to advance. The church was never intended to lay dormant. The church was never supposed to just be a place where Christians can gather, hug each other, sing kumbaya, 
you know, just have some niceties and go out. The church was designed by God to advance. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Gates don't attack you, you attack the gates. And so the Bible says in Ephesians chapter four, verse one, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So we're called to sit and then we're called to walk. Everything that we do comes out of a position of rest. We're not walking in the kingdom to earn God's love. We're not walking in the kingdom to earn God's approval. We already have that. We're walking because we have the authority. We're walking because we have the confidence. We're walking because God is for you and not against you. We're walking because God has commanded us to take territory. And so whenever we take land, whenever we take buildings, whenever we take property, whenever people get saved, when anything in the tangible world goes from being in the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, when we take territory, the kingdom of God is advancing. It's advancing. The third word is the word stand. This requires boldness, confidence, courage, resilience, in the foundations of who we are. It says there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 11, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armour that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Verse 14, stand Therefore, six chapters wrapped up, the, some people have called it the Magna Carta of Christianity, wrapped up in those three words, sit, walk, and stand. We need, to, we need to understand this is what God's called us to do because the enemy comes at us with three words. The devil only comes for one purpose and that's to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He comes to steal your joy. He comes to steal your confidence. He comes to steal your love. He comes to steal your faith. He comes to steal your hope. He comes to steal your purpose. And He comes to steal your resolve. But we are seated in heavenly places. We are full of the authority of God. We are not, we are not deluded or uninformed about the devil's devices. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. He comes to bring death through sickness, through disease, through poverty, through super suicidal thoughts, through violence, through weapons, with drugs, with alcohol. He comes to steal from us and He comes to kill us. You can't play games with the devil. He only has one agenda. Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. That's how He lures you in. He lures you in with, that's attractive, that looks good, that looks fine. What, what harm can that do? And then you step in and He steals. You step in and He kills. And the end result is that He wants to bring destruction. He hates you. He hates your family. He hates your inheritance. He hates your legacy. He hates everything that's coming after you. And so he wants to steal, kill, and then bring destruction into your family. The devil's number one objective is to bring destruction into the family. So everything God has ordained for us, everything that's in this earthly realm, to bring it into our position, there's gonna be a fight in the heavenly realms. Everything that God has allowed for us in the tangible realm, is gonna face a challenge in the invisible realm. Everything that you're trying to see in your hand, whether it be finance, whether it be a wedding, whether it be an engagement, whether it be friendship, whether it be food on your table or a house to live in or a vehicle to drive or a car, a, a, a job to go to or a holiday that you, whatever it is in the tangible, there's gonna be a fight against that in the invisible. The battle is a spiritual battle. We've got to get our head around that. The devil is our adversary. Someone has accurately put it like this. They said, evil 
is not something. Evil is someone. Evil is not something. Evil is someone. So it says in verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I love the way uh, a Bible teacher by the name of Derek Prince has uh, paraphrased this particular verse. He says, for our wrestling match is with persons without bodies against rulerships and the realms of their authority, against world dominators of the present darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. The spiritual attack that we experience, the spiritual resistance that we've got to press up against and push against is highly organized, it's efficient, it's centrally governed, it's invisible, but it's all real. The reality is that you and I did not invent the spirit realm. It wasn't like what we got together and we imagined God or we imagined D. It wasn't like the church government got together and thought, man, we need to fight something. And we imagined somehow cosmic forces, spiritual powers, workers of darkness. We didn't imagine that into being. The opposite is true. Everything that's tangible, everything that you can see came out of the invisible. God, who is a spirit, and we need to worship it in spirit and truth, imagined us. And God spoke us into being. The planet that we live on, the galaxies that we are still discovering, God spoke into being. Everything in the tangible came out of the invisible. And so the reality is that the invisible is more real than us. Now, I know that we don't think like that. We don't think like that. Because when it's, when it's our culture, we think everything outside our culture is incorrect. It's like, like English-speaking people, like me. English-speaking person. We think anybody that didn't grow up with English as a first language and grew up whether that be Spanish or French or uh, Ghan, whatever it, may, wherever it is, and then they try to speak English back to us with an accent or broken English that we think somehow they're not as smart as us. We just think that, that's what happens. We know, and we think in English, if they can't understand us in English, and you maybe just be able to understand us in whatever language, that if we speak English slowly, and with accentuation, that you'll be able to understand English. I was, I was in the airport in Poland and my flight got delayed coming out and we had to spend about two hours just waiting for the plane. And so I didn't wanna have downtime. So I thought I need, to, I need to plug my computer in, but I had an American lead and needed an European lead and didn't have the adapter. And, walked around the airport and found this shop in Poland that sold adapters so you could plug in. Person from Poland, strangely enough, did not speak English. Not a lick of English. Nada, zilch, nothing, no English. I didn't speak any Polish, but I wanna buy an adapter. So I did what every English speaking person does when they're trying to communicate to people in a foreign language. I spoke loudly slowly and with accentuation. I, like, I said to the person, I want to buy money, cash, purchase, buy an adapter. American plug, European plug, adapter, power into my computer. Can I have an adapter for my computer? And the person looked back to me and went, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm a genius. I'm an international correspondent. She came back with a dishcloth. She came back with a Polish dishcloth. But it's a little bit like that in, in, in the natural world. We, we can tend to look at the spiritual world like it's not really there. 
because we're looking out of it from the tangible world. But the spirit realm is more real than what we are. So you can pray a prayer and there can be spiritual opposition. The book of Daniel chapter 10, we see a little bit about that, how Daniel prayed a prayer and God said, I heard your prayer. I heard your prayer a few weeks ago. But when the prayer was being released, there was a battle in the heavenly realms. Michael the archangel had to get called in. We had to call in archangels. There was a fight. There was a battle. Getting the answer to your prayer to you. I heard it. I responded. But there was a fight of resistance trying to stop you from getting what God had destined for you. And our problem is we pray, we believe, we release it in faith. It gets caught in the battle and we don't fight and it doesn't happen. And so we come up with an excuse, well, God didn't want me to have that. Or maybe God wanted me to suffer or maybe God. And we, we put it on God when it was on our responsibility because we're told, put on the armour of God and fight back. There's a fight against you. Like if you're out there today and there's an ice cream on the table. And it's the last one there and you're gonna go for it. And then Paul Lawrence sees the ice cream. He's just bailing to go. He launches in the air to get the ice cream. You're gonna fight back. You're gonna push back. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Jesus spoke about the spiritual battle. They accused him of being demonic. He's like a kingdom can't stand against itself and be divided. He's like, there's a devil, there, there, are, there are demons, there are principalities, there are powers, and I'm not on their side, I'm against them. So there is a spiritual fight that's happening. Now this must be an awakening for Paul because he has been arrested by flesh. He's been persecuted by flesh. He has been jailed by flesh. He has been guarded by flesh, he's been persecuted and attacked by flesh and blood. But he is saying, despite all that, this is not about flesh and blood. The battle is spiritual. And he wants us to identify it's a spiritual battle and engage us in spiritual warfare. So he's like, I'm summing up the book of Ephesians. I know what's coming to you and what's gonna resist you getting it. And so I need you to be equipped spiritually. And so Paul's looking around, how can I convey this to you? What sort of a sermon illustration? And I, I love the fact that he uses the armour of God, that he's in captivity, he's with Roman soldiers, he's checking them out, looking what they're doing, and he, he creates a sermon illustration out of the armour of God. Now it does have foundation in the Old Testament, but he's using a sermon illustration based on what he can see. It's like the, the very, very first, you know, seeker-friendly message. Uh, and so he sees a Roman soldier and he breaks down, because that's how preachers operate. We don't have circumstances. We have illustrations. Nothing ever happens to me. Things only ever happen for me. So when something happens around me, I'm not like, oh, it's a circumstance, it's a problem. No, I'm like, okay, what sermon illustration can I pull from this? I live my life like that. I don't have, if I get bad customer service, it's not bad customer service, it's a sermon illustration. It's gonna come out somewhere. I remember, I think it was United Airlines or something some years back, and I was getting just terrible customer service from the girl at the desk, just terrible, awful. So bad she could have worked for Delta. And so just terrible, <laughs> terrible customer service. And so I, I looked at her and, and I said to her, do you see how many miles I fly? She says, yes, Mr. Morgan, I can, I can see that you fly a lot of miles. You know why I fly? No, Mr. Morgan, I have no idea why you fly. I fly because people pay me to go there and speak. I talk for a living. And I'm always looking for illustrations. <laughs> and you right now, with this bad customer service, will one day become a sermon illustration. <laughs> and if you keep giving me super bad customer service, you're gonna move from a sermon illustration into a whole series of messages. <laughs> so Paul's looking at the 
Roman guards and he's drawing his illustration from the armour of the Roman soldier. As one Bible scholar commented, he said, behind the human aspects of opposition and seduction, the writer detects the presence of superhuman forces arrayed against the church. The assaults of demonic powers require heavenly aid to repel. And it is the epistle's conviction in true Pauline fashion that God has placed at the Christian's disposal all that is needed to resist such an attack. In particular, the various pieces of armour are listed. So he says, Paul sums it up. He realises that we're coming under attack. He uses this illustration and he looks at the Roman soldier. And I say that because some people try to make a doctrine out of the helmet has to always be this and the sword always has to be that. But if you go through the Bible, you'll find out that the helmet means things and the breastplate means things in different areas. It's an illustration to demonstrate a spiritual point, but a very effective illustration. So, so I want you to take up the armour of God. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There is a fight. And so church, I need you to be battle ready. That's what Paul's saying. If you're not battle ready, you're going to get beaten up. You're going to get beaten up. How many people enjoyed the praise and worship this morning while I think about it? It was like, that was like a testosterone overload. Aileen, you were like a rose amongst thorns up here today. I was like, all these guys up here, we've got enough testosterone to start a small jet. So to get battle ready, here's the first thing. To be battle ready, you need to be filled with confidence. I talked about that last week. Confidence is not like confidence. Confidence can be in you. Confidence is my confidence is in God. I, I have my confidence and my faith in God. To be battle ready, you need to be filled with confidence. To be battle ready, you need to be, have intel. You need to know who, where, why. You need to understand it is a spiritual battle that we're in. To be battle ready, you need to be prepared to take your stand. It says, therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand firm, stand. So he says, you're gonna take up the whole armour of God. You've got to put it on. But I want you to put it on. I want you to take your stand. I want you to stand in boldness and I want you to stand in authority. There was a book written in the 70s uh, called Dress for Success. And the whole concept behind that is that you would put on clothes. And when people see the clothes, they're going to respond uh, in a certain way. You may have heard the, the phrase, clothes makes the man. It, it, and it has a dual meaning. One, when people see your clothes and how you dress, they make an assumption. The Bible put it like this, man looks at the outward appearance. So that's how that operates. But equally so, when you put clothes on, it makes you feel a certain way. So if I'm wearing board shorts and a tank top and flip-flops, I'm probably not planning to go into a business meeting. But if I put on a suit, tie, shoes, probably not thinking about going down to the beach. Because same me, different clothes means it positions me in a different way. And so the whole book on uh, dress for success was if you want to have power, you wear the red tie. You know the power tie? So wear the power red tie, blue suit, navy blue suit, power tie, power handshake. They used to even teach on giving the power handshake. Anybody that shakes your hand where they tip it over like this and their hand's on top, they've read the book. <laughs> if it ever happens to you, just tilt their hand up and go, ah, hey, nah, <laughs> not going to work. So you see presidents doing that in the debates. When it comes to the debates, you'll have the two contenders racing for the presidency of the United States and they'll have power ties on, they have power suits on because they're ready to show their authority and you look at them and you give them respect from what you see on the outside. And so this is what happens. So Paul is saying, hey, listen, I, I want you to be battle ready. I want you to put on the whole armour of God. I, I, I want you, you know, they used to say like a, a big wig is only a small wig away from home with a briefcase. The briefcase makes you feel better. And so Paul says, if you want to stand in authority, you've got to put on the armour of God. Once you've strengthened yourself in the Lord, once you have 
positioned yourself with a seated in the heavenly places, walking out, standing firm, then you need to put on the whole armour of God. You need to dress for success. And when you dress for success, when you dress in the armour of God, you can stand in the evil day. So what's the evil day? The evil day is any day that the enemy releases evil against you. So he may not release evil against you, maybe it's against your siblings or your spouse or your friends or your business or your community. The evil day is any time the evil forces the invisible evil forces are engaged in an attack. And so Paul's saying, as a Christian, don't be subject to the attack. You have the authority. You have the power. You've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness. Put on the armour of God, dress in the armour of God and stand there and resist the attack of the enemy. You've got to have that faith. I'm not proud of this, but I have done it. So I tell you as somebody who's not proud, sort of slightly, but not proud of this moment, I have done it, not recently, quite a while ago, but I have done it. My pet peeve in, is in an airport or anywhere that's a public space filled with people walking is someone walking through the airport like this. Because what they're saying is, no other of the 5,000 people here are important I'm the only one that's important. This person on the other end of this phone or on Facebook or whatever, Instagram, it's TikTok, I'm doing the dance, whatever, is incredibly important. And they're walking through a crowd. Do anybody else hate that? Is it just me? I hate that. And so I may or may not have locked my shoulder in and aligned myself with the person walking at a furious pace towards me looking at their phone, not seeing me, and I may have gone, boom, and hit them with my shoulder. That's sort of what this is talking about. It's talking about taking your stand. The enemy comes and you just stand, boom, you're not getting past me. Bam, you're not, you're not gonna have authority. I, I'm standing in confidence. I am clothed in the armour of God. I'm gonna stand, I'm gonna hold ground, I'm gonna be battle ready, I'm gonna be ready to go. If you're gonna be battle ready, you need the undergirding, of truth. Bible says in verse 14, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16 and 17 says, These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another and love no false oath. For all these things I hate, declares the Lord. God loves truth. Jesus said, sanctify them through the truth. My word is truth. And so there's the truth of God's word that we need to lay hold of. And anytime your truth comes into conflict with God's truth, your truth needs to yield to God's truth. That's how you gird your loins with truth. But the girding of the loins meant they had all these loose fabrics and loose garments that they would gird up and they would strap in. They could hang this sword, they would strap in. And it meant now I can, I can run freely. I can act, I'm not gonna get tripped up by some you know, bit of fabric dangling down, hitting my foot and me falling because I've girded my loins. I'm able to move freely. I'm able to fight. I'm able to kick back. I'm able to attack. And that, that's what truth, Zachariah said it, uh, Paul wrote it, be truthful. I would encourage us as Christians, don't lie, be truthful. The great thing about being truthful and honest is you don't have to cover your tracks. If you lie, then you've got to have another lie to cover up that lie. And eventually you've got a web of lies and the people may not know you're lying, but the invisible realm knows you're lying. You can't hide your lies from the enemy. So I may lie to your face, but the devil knows it's a lie and I'm not gonna be able to fight because I'm being caught in a lie. And so there has to be integrity. If we're gonna fight spiritually, there has to be integrity in our soul. We have to be tellers of the truth. We need to be what I would call a WYSIWYG Christian. I'm not even sure they use this terminology anymore. WYSIWYG was an acronym. What you see is what you get. Back in the day when computers were sort of coming out, what was on the screen would not be what was printed on the page. 
So they coined this phrase, it happened like in Word uh, and all sorts of different programs like that, that when you see it on the screen and you print it out on the page, what you see is what you get. I believe that's what we need to be like as Christians. What you see is what you get. We need to be as honest on Sunday as we are on Monday. We need to be as holy coming into church as we are leaving the church. What you see is what you get. We we battle, youth pastors battle that all the time. Anywhere I've been, myself included, battle it. You, You battle it with teenagers. Not because necessarily the teenager's a liar, but because the teenager is coping with the hypocrisy of their parents. I've seen it happen at church, not at this church, but I've seen it happen in church where I was out in the parking lot and the parents were driving in with the kids at the back and they're just like yelling at them and yeah, I'll kill you, I'll break your face. And I drop in cuss words, driving in the parking lot. I'm not exaggerating. No, there's no story in this, this is accurately happening. People are yelling, Aah! and pull their car up, close the door, grab their Bible, hallelujah. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, all that is within me. I love His name. I love His name. He's just so good. They get their big Bible and they walk into church. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Send their kids off to youth ministry or kids ministry. They sing all the songs. Hallelujah. God's so good. I pray. Oh, and they get their Bible. together. Come on, kids. Praise His holy name. They close the door. We should be consistent. I hope, my prayer is what you see on the stage on Sunday is what happens on Monday, that we we all should be honest and integrous with who we are. Do you, but choose true. That's what I always say. To be battle ready, you need the boldness of righteousness. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, you strap on the breastplate of righteousness. The book of Proverbs says, the wicked flee when no one is pursuing them, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. If you're saved, the blood of Jesus is on your life. You stand pure and holy before God. You are not an ex anything. You are a new creation. All the old has passed away. You get a clean slate. You get a do-over. You get a fresh beginning. You get the blood of Jesus on your life and you can walk in to the throne room of God boldly and you can cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. That's, That's the privilege that we have. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. It came to us when we were seated in heavenly places, but it is ours. The breastplate of righteousness means that we can stand in all authority. We can stand in all power. You're not just standing in your own righteousness. We're standing in the rightness of God. And so the devil will try to steal your thoughts and tell you you're no good. The devil will try to steal your thoughts and tell you you're ugly, you're hopeless, you'll never make it. And you need to be able to stand in the righteousness of God. To be about already, you need the truth of the gospel. Anna already has spoken about that uh, earlier today in her prayer. As shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now the shoes of the Roman soldier weren't slippers, they weren't dancing shoes, they weren't flip-flops, they were made for war. And historians tell us that the Romans won a lot of their battles because of their shoes. Some say that at the bottom of their shoes they had cleats that would help them get firm in the ground so they couldn't be easily knocked over. Paul says, looks at the feet and goes, this is what we need to be. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of Him who brings good news and publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet that declare the goodness of God 
How beautiful when someone steps in to the situation and they're declaring the goodness of God. How great it is when you stand in prayer and somebody stands up here today and prays and declares the gospel, which is good news of God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because He's anointed me to preach the gospel. Who to? To the brokenhearted. Those who've had their hearts smashed into thousands of pieces. God said, I've come to put your heart back together with no join marks, everything looking whole. He's come to preach the gospel to the poor. What is gospel to the poor? Is you do not have to live under the curse of poverty. He who was rich became poor, so you who are poor can become rich. A job is supposed to be in your agenda. Promotion is supposed to be in your agenda. Your business is supposed to break through. These are promises of God. Good news to the poor is you don't have to be poor. It's never good news to a poor person that you're more poor than they're poor. Because they're looking at you to try to help them. And you can't help them out of your poverty. Good news to the poor, healing, healing to the blind. I love what Helen Keller said. She was asked, can you think of anything else worse than being blind? And she said, yeah, to be able to see but not have vision. The word when it talks about being blind is like opaque, like seeing through a glass dimly. I see men like trees walking. I don't see things clearly. I, I, I'm struggling. So I've, I, I've come to remove the fog. I've come to give you accuracy. Oh, he talks about all those things that are, that are the power of the gospel. And when we walk it out, we're not just walking it out in our life, but we're bringing it to other people. We are carriers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You do not need to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Don't need to be ashamed. And there may be things that happen in church that are a little embarrassing every now and then, but you don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. Jesus will never let you down. There has to be truth. There has to be confidence in the Word of God. And you need to make sure that you have shoes on your feet of the gospel of peace. To be battle ready, you need the resistance of faith. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you are able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. In week one of our series, if you, if you didn't get the whole series, check it out online. Uh, Dr. Anna spoke about the shield of the Roman soldiers and how they would gather together in unison and they'd move forward as one big army. The shield has a whole heap of different connotations. Some say that the shields were made of leather and that the soldiers would soak the, uh, the shield in water or a solution. And so when the darts were fired at them, the water would extinguish the dart. But Paul's writing here and says, listen, I want you to take that shield. I want you to stand there. And when the enemy throws anything at you, you by faith are like, no, no way. Not gonna happen. Not on God's agenda. Not on God's Word. You're a loser. I'm not a loser. I am ahead. I am not the tail. I am above and I am not beneath. I, uh, uh, well, you can't do anything. Oh, that's, yeah, yes, I can. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You gotta pick up that shield and boom, I'm not taking your fiery dart. The fiery darts come to attack your mind. The battleground is in here. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. If you can send a dart into your thinking and get you thinking opposite to what God says about you, there's a dart. So you need to know the Word of God. You need to be able to stand there in faith. So the enemy says, you're no good. Boom, yes, I am. Get out of my face. Get out of my face. Well, you're an accident. You weren't mean to be born. While you were even on the world, boom, I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Get out. Before I was even born, when I was in the womb, He fashioned me. He designed me. He put things in my DNA. He put things in my, I got personality in there. I got giftings in there. There's certain things I can do, certain things I can't do. I don't want to do because I'm not called to do them. But there's certain things in me that He put there right there. When I was inside, before anybody, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, He named my name. In other words, He proclaimed my destiny. When no one even knew back then what gender the baby was going to be. So when the enemy throws stuff at you, you've got to pick the shield up and you've got to resist back. This is not who I am. This is not where I'm heading. Word of God to fight. Some of you would have heard this story before, but some years ago, I was doing a Youth Alive rally in Melbourne, Australia, and I was freaking out and intimidated. One of the first youth conferences I've ever done. 
They put a lot of money into this event. I'm the guest speaker, and I'm thinking, I've got nothing to say. I prepared a message, but my insecurity had overwhelmed me in my mind, the battleground. I'm not understanding clearly that the devil's attacking my mind because he doesn't want the altar call to happen for people to get saved. So there's a spiritual battle happening. And I'm like, I can't do this. I'm gonna be horrible. I remember standing in the front row worshiping and the girl who was singing was just awful. And I can remember thinking, oh my gosh, she's awful. And I'm gonna be awful. This whole thing is gonna be awful. All these people put all this energy into this event. This is an awful event. And I, I, I was trying to get out. I was trying to get out of the event. I'm, I'm making trumpet sounds and the, the rapture, let's go. Come on, let's, you know. I, I just want to yell out, fire, run. Like I was trying to empty the building. Finally, they called me to go on. So I'm standing. I'm standing on the back of the stage. There's a curtain sort of thing. I'm waiting to go on. And then all of a sudden, I thought to myself, hang on a moment. This is not what God said about me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's called me to preach. He's called me to preach the gospel. And so I can do this. I can do it because why? Because Christ strengthens in me. Where do I need God to strengthen me? I need you to strengthen my faith. I need you to strengthen my courage. I need you to strengthen my communication. I need you to strengthen my altar call. I need you to strengthen my move in the Spirit. I need you to strengthen my focus. I need you to strengthen my courage. I can do all things. I can do this. I can stand up in front of a few thousand people and preach to God. Why? Because God has called me. I am destined to be in the kingdom for such a time as this. And what happened was I took the Word of God and exchanged my insecurities with God's truth. I stood there with a shield of faith as the enemy's just like, choo, choo, with these fiery dust. I'm like, get out of my face. I'm gonna go and crush your spirit. To be battle ready, you need the revelation of salvation. Take on the helmet of salvation to know that you are saved, to know. The, the word salvation is a huge word in the Greek, sozo. It means healing, it means deliverance, it means freedom, it's big. It's not... It, it, Christianity is not about some pie in the sky when you die. It's not just about heaven. Heaven is a great location, definitely better than hell. But heaven's not the only thing that Christianity is all about. We are not here selling fire insurance. If we were just here selling fire insurance, I'd be up here just with knitting, talking about customising something for my dog so we could customise your fire insurance. But we're not doing that. We're here because it changes life right here, right now. This is where the battle is. It's in the invisible. You gotta, you gotta bring it into the spirit, out of the spiritual, into reality. The fight is right now. And so when you put on salvation, the helmet of salvation, you say, I am thinking the right way. I am holy. I'm a child of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a man of God. I'm a son of God. I, I, I am walking. In the, you gotta know who you are. Turn to the person beside you and say, you are far more awesome than you give yourself credit for. To be battle ready, you need to trust in His Word. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. I love that. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. I love what Paul said to Timothy, he said, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So the Word of God can be, can be the Bible. As I just illustrated a moment ago, taking Scripture out and praying out Scripture. That, that can be the Word of God. But in context for Paul preaching, who doesn't have a New Testament, he's writing a letter to the church at Ephesus, has no idea in his head that God's breathing on him, and this is gonna become in the canon of Scripture. He doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't have a Bible. So he's going on prophecies. Paul, Timothy, I want you to fight the good fight through every prophecy that's being given to you. What are the prophecies that are being given to you? What has God spoken over your life? What has God promised you? What is God's word? What, you've been on an altar call and someone's prayed over you. They said you're gonna be a great man of God or a great woman of God or there's destiny on your life. Paul saying to Timothy, I want you to recall that. What came out of faith? What came out of prayer? What was, what was proclaimed over you in a prophetic conference? What was proclaimed over you years ago? What, what has been said over you? 
to bring up those words of God. For me, Bible college is a man sent from God whose name is John. I remember that as clear as sitting there. And anytime there's a conflict, I've got to sit back and go, hang on a second. This is what God told me in my 20s. There's a man sent from God whose name is John. That's me. I'm a man sent from God whose name is... This, you, you've got to take those prophecies and you've got to fight. When, when we were coming here and praying over pastoring the church... My wife, Anna, was at a conference in San Diego a few years ago, and a well-known prophet from New Zealand just happened to be sitting beside her, and he said, and, and she wasn't in a meeting, she, it wasn't prophesying, just sitting down beside her. He says, God just spoke to me and told me to tell you this. And when he downloaded what he was saying, it described word of life in detail. Like it just described word of, this is years before we were even on the agenda here. We just put it on the back burner. Describe the Word of God in detail. And then, he, then at the end of it was to revive it and turn it into an apostolic centre. And there was more, more to the Word than that. And I remember when I was sitting with uh, Dr. Roden and Pastor Isaac, and I shared this word. I said, you know, where all things are coming together. And then Anna reminded me of this word. Does this sound like it fits here? And they're like, this sound like, it sounds like it fits here. So my prayer life took that into play. You'll hear me talk about our church being an apostolic center. We have a vision that we're gonna raise up leaders. I've been talking to our school principals of taking children from K right through to graduating high school and putting them into Bible college, training them up as interns and releasing them. And rather than just sending our money overseas to missions, that we're about to send missionaries overseas to do missions. That we're gonna raise up a generation. Why? Because we're an apostolic center. We're gonna plant churches. We're gonna release ministries. We are one church, many languages. There are multiple languages that we can have church services in. We have the building, we have the facility, we have the know-how, we just need the leaders. And so in faith, you take the Word and you punch back. No, we're, we're, we're not staying still. We are moving forward. God is in our side. We're going to fight the good fight through the, wo the Word of God made concerning us. But the sword of the Spirit, even though it's a powerful weapon, a sword can only reach a certain distance. Some of them were like a dagger. Some of them like a large sword. But let's even call it four feet away. The furthest I can get in the armour with a sword is about four feet. And Paul doesn't introduce this as a part of the armour. But I'm not sure that there's anything more powerful. He says, praying all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So to be battle ready, you need the superpower of prayer. To be battle, that the thing that can go, the, can go from close by to be launched is prayer. We are a house of prayer. In, in just a moment, Russell and the band can come up now. In just a moment, I'm gonna invite our pastors and deacons and their spouses to come and they're going to have oil if they need it and pray and then we're going to, we're going to ask you if you are here today and you're in a spiritual battle we want, we want to pray for you we want to believe God our, our second amendment spiritual right is to fight back in prayer it's the thing that can go outside this room it's the thing that can go way beyond me travels there's no distance Years ago when I was preaching in Serbia, I was in Belgrade and we're driving through the city and it was when the Bosnian Serb war was on and there was all sorts of conflict. But I remember driving past one building downtown in Belgrade that was totally annihilated, big hole in the side where a, where a bomb had gone in and imploded everything on the inside. Left everything on the other side of the building totally intact, but took out this one area. Bomb went in, imploded. But that bomb wasn't launched close, it was launched on a ship miles away, that got the designated target, hit a button, launched it and took it out. That's what prayer does. Paul, prayer's like you've got the briefcase with the code. You've got, you've got the nuclear armament of heaven to pray. And you don't have to pray alone. You can pray in faith alone, but you can pray together. Wherever two agree together, it's done, it's established. And so the greatest strength that we have, 
line up in the armour of God. Be able to stand midweek. You are not a victim, you have victory. You are, you are not oppressed, you are a winner. Stand and know who you are in the things of God. But when you take a hit, as sometimes we do, or you're feeling weak, as sometimes we do, or you're struggling, as sometimes we do, then you need to get somebody with you and say, can you pray with me? Because that's what the church is here for. We're the body of Christ. We are the family of God. We are, thank the Lord I put a lid on that. We're the family of God. We're supposed to stand together in faith. I invite you to stand with me right now. Thank you so much for joining Word of Life Church on our YouTube channel today. Our prayer is that your faith was strengthened and you were encouraged. If you happen to make a life-changing decision today and accepted Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, would you send us a message and tell us about it? We would love to help you along your faith journey. Another way to stay connected is by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell to receive notifications. That way you never miss another message here at Word of Life. We hope you have an amazing day. Thank you again for watching. God bless you.